Thanks, guys. I understand we're being recorded, so I won't say anything horrifying. Or, or <laughs> I won't intentionally say anything <laughs> horrifying. We'll start with confessions, and I will confess that the confessions I intend are not the confessions of St. Augustine of Hippo, here having a complicated conversation with the devil. Uh, I will not divulge to you my innermost worries and fears, but I will confess to you that uh, following whatever that is, I'm a believer. So uh, I'm here at BYU speaking uh, as a believing scholar uh, rather than as a wholly neutral scholar. The book project from which this is coming is uh, neutral, typical, typical academic stuff. But I, I like coming to BYU because I get to experiment with being uh, a little bit more open about who I am. The confessions other than being a believer are uh, these two here. And I want to be sympathetic to people who have had other approaches to the Book of Mormon. But just to be clear to you that what I'm doing today and in this chapter from a book is trying to think about reading the Book of Mormon as scripture rather than as an artifact. I, I'm not particularly trying to figure out what, what part of uh, Hebrew syntax is being invoked in a particular place, but trying to engage the Book of Mormon as a revelatory text and be open to the fact that the Book of Mormon very self-consciously, all throughout the Book of Mormon, is wanting to talk to us where us includes the 19th century Latter-day Saints and we're sort of the tagalongs who are here because the world didn't end uh, when people thought it would. But uh, when I talk about the Book of Mormon in terms of its relevance for the 19th century, I'm not trying to say the Book of Mormon is not an ancient historical scriptural text. I'm trying to say the Book of Mormon is a scripture, ancient scripture, that's talking to people in the 19th century. It's very clear about it. Look at the moments when they suddenly look up from inscribing the plates and they say, I'm looking at you, bozo, right at the 19th century readers. It's very clear that they're worried about that. So I am not uh, trying to get into fights about what the, when the Book of Mormon comes or whether God had a hand in it, but specifically to allow the Book of Mormon license to be what it says it is, which is a revealed scripture talking to people in the 19th century. By way of the roadmap, I want to talk a little bit about the Bible's crisis in the 19th century, how the Book of Mormon sought to solve the Bible's crisis, and then have a little uh, afterthought, if there's time, thinking about what this tells us about the ways Mormons read the Bible. And I guess the advantage to this, can you guys hear me if I wander, or is that taxing, hearing aids, etc.? Okay, I'm a little bit of a wanderer. So let's talk, not in the bad way, I, I just mean I wander about the rostrum. Uh, <laughs> The thing, to, the thing to be mindful of with the Bible and the reason that it was felt to be in crisis by many was that the Bible was being asked to do things it hadn't really been asked to do before. In the aftermath of the Reformation, I understand Craig Harleen's biography of Luther is excellent and soon to be out. So a little BYU tie-in here for a moment. But in the aftermath of Luther and his deep allergy to what he saw as corrupt ecclesial hierarchy, we had a Bible that was being asked to take the place of the magisterium of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church's magisterium is its authority to interpret the Bible and to deal with aspects of life, both secular and religious, that were not explicitly specified in the Bible. So for the Catholics, the Bible is important. It's a bunch of Protestant uh, propaganda that the Catholics didn't care about the Bible. But the Bible occupied a place within a broader intellectual environment and context that allowed solutions to disagreements about what the Bible meant and that allowed them to have responses to things that weren't clearly specified in the Bible. It also becomes the case that the Bible becomes and is expected to be the sole or primary vessel by which the Word of God, capital W here, in the sense that the, that which God uh, speaks or wishes to be spoken needs to be tethered to the Bible in some important way. Increasingly, as Sheehan has indicated in the Enlightenment Bible, a great, very readable history of the reception and translation of the Bible in this period, the Bible increasingly has to bear the weight of religion and science. Magisterium, quite flexible, could go wherever it needed to go. The Bible, though, is a very specific set of texts that will need to be reinterpreted to engage changes in the world uh, that are occurring from the 15th and 16th centuries right on to the present day. So the Bible is being asked to do a lot of things that it didn't used to have to do. 
And that leads to a kind of crisis. And I'll talk about each one of these four things in turn. The first is the problem of translation. Again, Sheehan's Enlightenment Bible, it's a great book. There are other interesting books written about this. But there's a sense in which there's a hope that you can get the Bible to do what you need it to do if you can just get it translated correctly. You don't need the frickin' magisterium. Good heavens, we don't want the Catholics back. But manifestly, the Bible is very hard to interpret and sort of weird. The solution is to translate it. The problem is, every translator takes a little bit of a different tack. And not only are there multiple translations, but get this, the King James translation in Britain called the Authorized Version that is the established, definitive, everybody's supposed to read it. There's that cute but sort of tired joke now that the, a, a British commoner says, look, if the King James Bible's English is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, right? There is a sense in which the Authorized Version was felt to be the actual Bible. But even the King James Bible, uh, scholars with lots more time than I have, have been able to document thousands of variants of the King James text. Remember, this is old school. You had to typeset things by hand. So not only do you have fights about translations, you also have fights about which versions of which translations uh, can be used. And then increasingly in the 19th century, the old story has been that it's not till the end of the 19th century that Americans become aware of higher Bible criticism. But there's some very interesting work in the last five years that makes pretty clear that by the end of the 18th and early 19th centuries, Americans are beginning to grapple with these questions. And one of the questions they're having to grapple with is the fact that Erasmus, when he put together the collection of texts that became the received text of the Bible in Greek, missed a ton of important manuscripts. So now you have a multiplicity of Greek manuscripts. You have a multiplicity of translations. And each translation has multiple versions. It's a little bit dizzying. And how precisely can the Bible be unitary when even the Bible as the Bible exists in so many variations? There's this, I sort of love snark. We think that snark is new to us, but snark is old. This is uh, in the front of the Douay Bible, which is a Catholic translation of the Bible that's published in America. I think it was in Philadelphia. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But they, they write a letter, these Catholics, writing to the Protestants of the United States. Many of the most learned Protestant divines, your people, by the way, have produced weighty objections to particular passages in the common Church of, English, Church of England translation of the scriptures. That there are various and important errors in it is too well known to admit of controversy. So uh, they're being a little bit dingoes here, but they're also speaking the truth. And increasingly it was known that even the word of God, the Bible whose English was good enough for Jesus, so it's good enough for us, had a lot of problems. It was never perfect to begin with, and it became less perfect over time. There's another thing that people began to understand more as they began to read more travel writing, as they began to process in different ways access to philosophical meditations that are associated with travel. And what they came to understand more and more was that the people that lived in the ancient Near East were not especially 19th century Americans. So there's a cultural distance that begins to arise. Now this clearly waxes and wanes, and we definitely have Southern California white man Jesus for a long time in America. I'm not saying that everybody always remembered that the ancient Near East was different from us, but it became increasingly a problem in the 19th century. We are not Jews of the Second Temple period under Roman occupation. And does that mean we're able to interpret it or not? There's something else that's going on, and that's what, uh, that's what Holly Field Brooks Hollyfield is called evidential Christianity, and I think he's in the ballpark of correct about it. It's the notion that Christianity needs to situate itself in new rhetorical styles and in new ideas about content that are relevant to what we now think of as science. And this from Lyman Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe's paw, uh, is reasonably typical of a reasonable number of Protestants. That he says that his mode of philosophizing is the Baconian. So that's that's his way of saying I'm a scientific thinker. Facts and the Bible are the extent of my philosophy. And facts and the Bible have increasingly come to be seen as quite alien. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, they are widely separated now, even though they thought back at the time it was a love that would last forever. So evidential Christianity <laughs> begins to, see I watch People magazine. Or no, that's a magazine you have to read. No, you watch it. I think you watch People Magazine rather than read it. <laughs> so the issue, though, is that increasingly people said, look, I know that there are ancient scriptural texts of other people. 
I know that they're starting to get published and talked about. But we know that the Bible is actually correct because we have solid evidence of it. It comports well with what we understand about nascent science. But there's some complexity here. A lot of what they mean by science really is their reflection of what's called common sense realism or Scottish common sense philosophy. And to an extent that I don't think you realize until you get reading the documents carefully, they really were, were orienting their rational processing of these questions to Scotland. Common sense had a few important assumptions about the world. One of them, which we won't talk about, is the notion that we have a special spiritual sense that allows us to arbitrate these kinds of questions. What I want to focus on here is the notion that what's true once is true always. Common sense says what's true is what reaches the intellect of non-deranged men. This was back when men uh, meant, I guess, just the, sorry, I'm being recorded. Um, so uh, this was, this, the notion was that good, wise men, not the irrational women, definitely white guys, definitely not people that you know, worship the Hindu gods, that as long as you could ask them and talk to them at length, they would all agree, no matter when they were born. So if they were born in 1000 BC, if they were rational men, they'd come to the same conclusion that somebody living in 1805 in Scotland and in America would come to. It's the notion that we're very comfortable with now, that what's true once is true always. But the problem is that evidential Christianity relied on a bootstrap that then burned the bridge that it had moved through. Because the Bible was true because there were miracles that proved it was true. All through the New Testament. People being raised from the dead. People who were unable to walk, suddenly able to walk, sight report restored to the blind. There were evidences all through the Bible. But they tossed the ladder away when they got in because cessationism, the dominant mode of talking about these questions, said that miracles are done. Miracles are over. They ended shortly after Christ left, presumably, or some, somewhere in there. Because it's pretty risky to allow miraculous things to prove a new doctrine. If somebody can come up with some faith cure and it just happens to work, evidential Christianity would say, the other things this person is about to say are true. So if you treat 100 people, 10 of them spontaneously recover, you claim those as your successes, even though they would have spontaneously recovered under the counterfactual, according to the assumptions of evidential Christianity, whatever else you had to say is God's own truth. That cardiac surgeon that like, snuffs weird things, Oz something or other, the guy with the like, TV show, this is a similar kind of a thing, right? He's almost like evidential Christianity. Dr. Oz, is that right? So he gets people who spontaneously recover while taking some strange placebo, and he advertises it, and then people listen to him talk about other things. It's a kind of evidential bootstrap that was very risky to allow it to on go, to be ongoing, so it had to be consigned to the past. But if it's consigned to the past, that breaks common sense, because it ought to still be true. There's an inconsistency here. Mormons loved to stick uh, sticks in the eyes of Protestant theologians and churchmen. Uh, one of the ways they did it was through science fiction. Those of you that love science fiction and are Mormon, there's ample precedent. I think this was Wild Bill Phelps uh, did a thought experiment where an alien came to the earth and asked a Protestant, tell me about religion and tell me about the Bible. And the stranger, this is an a, a space alien that's visiting, and this alien looked as though he was greatly disappointed. His hopes were entirely blasted when he learns that there were no more prophets and spiritual gifts. So when the alien hears about cessationism, and the alien is a classic thought experiment to show this is what common sense requires, right? The alien is the impartial witness from somewhere else who has the same common sense as the rest of us. You tell him cessationism, and he will be disappointed and entirely blasted and sink in despair. Mormons aren't the only ones that play that game, uh, but they do it quite well. Another problem that comes uh, increasingly uh, intensely in the 19th century, but is always a kind of problem, is canon. What do you do with canon? 
you give people a lot of access to the Bible, you tell people that all they need to know about God, the universe, and everything is in the Bible, they're going to read that pretty carefully. And they're going to find out that the Bible actually refers in an approving way to texts that are not in the Bible. And the Bible also has nothing to say about canonization. There are a couple places where you can sort of make an argument that it almost does, but nothing simple and straightforward to suggest that the Bible talks about canonization proper. But we all love conspiracy. And you can imagine if you're a common sense, individualistic person who believes in the fundamental integrity of the brain of the common man and woman, that you're going to read a book, you're going to see references to books that aren't even included in it, and you're going to cry foul. You're going to become an investigative reporter. So you have this kind of crisis. And not only do you have these tricky pieces, you also have the fact that that Douay version of the Bible that the Catholics publish has different books than the Protestants do. So if, in fact, the Bible is to be the only source or the purest source or the only relevant source of what's true about God, the universe, and everything, how do we even know which of the Bibles is true? There are a lot of moving parts. And then you've got this issue of authority. People talk about American voluntarism. And voluntarism basically means that you can pay your tithing to whichever church you want. Under establishment, you have to pay your tithing or the equivalent thereto a tax to the established church. Voluntarism says you don't have to pay that tax. And by extension, you don't have to be a member of that church. You can do your own thing. Some people would argue, oh, we're totally tolerant. You can go to whatever church you want. Just pay your tithing to the Church of England. So voluntarism says freedom from that, disestablishment. And you can imagine that once you tell people that they don't have to belong to a particular church, there will be some natural bubbling toward uh, differences. And so Americans become very denominational with a lot of very different churches. Now, most people who were Protestant and felt good about it, said, look, it's the body of Christ. Paul's metaphor about the body of Christ just says that you'll have a Baptist right leg, a Methodist left leg, an Anglican head, or I guess Episcopalian head, and you know, Presbyterian heart. It's okay. It's all well integrated. But critics said, time out. You got this Bible that's totally true and totally exhaustive, not exhausting, but exa well, exhausting too, maybe, but they didn't say that. It's exhaustive, and it's meant to be the rule of your life. So how is it that you can have this unitary self-interpreting Bible and have 25 different denominations that actually fight about it? And when you look at Joseph Smith's uh, autobiography about the stuff that led up to the first vision, he's clearly grappling with this story. How can it possibly be true that not only is the Bible unitary, we know that we're told that, but it even says in Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. How can that possibly be true and there be multiple Protestant denominations? What do we do with this? In 43, Joseph Smith says a little bit cryptically that there's no salvation between the lids of the Bible without a legal administrator. So he's starting to make an argument that sounds a little bit more Catholic, that you actually can't make it to God with the Bible alone. You've got to get a church. But you've got to have a church that actually truly comports with the Bible. You've got an authority problem. And some people thought they could solve it. Alexander Campbell, who is uh, Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon's arch nemesis for a lot of their uh, careers in church management, uh, is one of their most relevant reference. And if, if you're trying to understand the context, I think, as Chris Jones and others have showed, Reformed Methodists matter a lot, and this crowd, the Alexander Campbell, they're ex-Presbyterian, once Baptists, now restorationists of their own stripe. I think those two Protestant groups are probably the most relevant. So Campbell was quite adamant that Joseph Smith and others are right, that there should not be the multiplication of denominations. Where they differed was that Campbell said that you just got to read Acts in the original Greek, OPS, the way I translate it, and then you'll know. But this is obvious wishful thinking. Try to found even a social club based on the content in the book of Acts, and you'll have no idea, right? Is there somebody who always has to die when he falls asleep? Like, is that a standard part of <laughs> Christian practice? 
Do there have to be healings every time? Do you have to speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues? How do you even take the Eucharist? The Eucharist isn't even well specified in the Bible. So how on earth do you get to church from Bible? These are problems. There are others. I go into them in greater length in the chapter, but I thought we'd focus on those. So again, with the background that I understand the Book of Mormon to be a scripture that was intended from the beginning for the 19th century in America. It's quite explicit about that inside itself. The Book of Mormon has a solution for this. And the first thing is it has to kill the Protestant Bible, burn it to the ground. We'll talk a little bit more about what it's doing. Got to talk through the infidelity of language. You got to fix evidential Christianity and you got to get from Bible to church. And it's very clear to me from reading the documents that Joseph Smith understood that there was a primordial Bible and that primordial Bible was true and pure. What we don't know for sure entirely is how much of that Bible was written down. But there was some primordial Bible that in some semi-mystical and often not particularly mystical held together way, there is a primordial Bible. The Protestant Bible is a zombie. It's the reanimated corpse of the primordial Bible after it had been killed. And when you look at 1 Nephi 13, read it again as a story about the zombification of a primordial Bible. It's very clear that there is a corruption. And the only way to get rid of the corruption is to burn it to the ground. And I don't have enough time today to go into it in particular detail, but I'll just mention it here for those of you uh, that are interested in it. One of the key threats to the Protestant Bible was that it came increasingly to be seen as a regional scripture. The Enlightenment Project, and again, Sheehan does a very good job of this. The Enlightenment Project was to place the Bible in the context of other ancient religious writings, to make it just the scripture of the Hebrews at a particular period in time, not the world's only scripture. That was a threat to Protestants coming from the Enlightenment. The Book of Mormon embraces that whole hog. Yes, the Bible is a regional scripture. All scripture is regional. That's an example of the ways that it kills the Bible, eliminates its universal authority to make it regional in order to ultimately save it. Because Joseph Smith understood, and I think he's probably right, that scripture is always regional and contextual, even as it is purely true, uh, as it attempts to become uh, real in the world where we live. It's interesting. Now, mystical texts do this all the time. Uh, texts that are not generally understood to be deeply mystical don't tend to spend quite as much time as the Book of Mormon does saying, language is a mess. Language is imperfect. Remember, it's a grave threat to the Bible to admit that language is imperfect. The whole point of the Bible is that it's self-interpreting, it's a direct line, it's the red phone right to Jesus, it gets you immediate access to God through its perfect words. The Book of Mormon says, eh, I'm going to call BS on that. Language is always broken. Language is always human. Go through the text sometime. A few of the times they're just saying, look, I ran out of copy paper, right? A, a few times they say, my plates just aren't big enough. But most of the time they're saying, the stuff that really matters doesn't reduce to language in a straightforward way. Think about Jesus' ministry in the New World. They keep just saying, oh, we can't even figure out how to put in this, words, this into words. Tough. Sometimes they sort of gesture toward it with a sealed portion. But it seems to me to be indicating deeply and consistently that you can't get language to work the way you want it to. And specifically in here, they integrate into a much older set of traditions about the nature of written and oral language. It seems very clear from the Book of Mormon that written language alone can't work and neither can oral language alone work. There has to be a hybrid. And that hybrid, again, is inherently unstable for the American Protestant reading of the Bible. Joseph Smith is saying, not only can you not be saved without a church and a Bible, like he did in that quote from 1843, he's also saying, you can't access the Word of God 
without both a written text and a living prophet. The Bible is invalid according to the metrics that the Book of Mormon uses. In 43, again, he says, there are many things in the Bible which not as they now stand accord with the revelation of the Holy Ghost to me. And he's pairing a prophet who not just interprets, but also reveals in the act of interpretation and a text that depends on the interpretation of the prophet to be correct. So this, again, kills the Protestant Bible. The Bible cannot stand on its own without a prophet. And the Book of Mormon very clearly demonstrates that. Dude. The book, or dudettes, and et cetera. Is dude gender neutral? What's a gender neutral replacement for dude? Just saying, um. I'll say, um. Um. <laughs> Read the Book of Mormon with an eye to the problems of the evidences. It's staggering. Much of it is anti-cessationist. Much of it is just saying, look, if there are no signs, if there is no power of the Spirit, if there are no gifts of the Spirit, you're corrupted. That's clearly an important part. Because remember, the external evidences were miracles that proved that the prophet writing was correct, that what they were describing was true. And these signs, the miraculous signs, are the external evidences. So the Book of Mormon's anti-cessationism is a strong argument that the old model of external evidences, miracles to prove the Bible is true, is bunk. You need to still have external evidences or it doesn't work. The other thing to know is that internal, so Hollyfield and others divided into external evidences and internal evidences. External evidences, miracles. Cured somebody, this story is true. Internal evidences are more variable. The two main components of it are the effect of the text on the believer. So the text itself transforms morally the person who reads it. That's proof that the Bible is true. That's an internal evidence. The second is the perfect harmony within the disparate, or among the disparate texts of the Bible anthology. So the fact that the suffering servant motif in Isaiah seems like a decent description of Jesus' experience proves the Bible is true. And that's around harmony. The notion that these two totally different texts, now those of you that are academics will snicker a little bit because everybody likes to be holier than thou, including me, because uh, clearly that's absurd. This, this claim is clearly absurd from, a, from an academic perspective. But nevertheless, it was very vitally true for them that the harmony of the texts proved that they were true. So those are the internal evidences. And the internal evidences, think for a minute about that standard trope that, all, uh, that I've read, most of the non-Mormons reading the Book of Mormon say, isn't that funny? that they have Christians long before Christ. Clearly a part of the Book of Mormon. Clearly odd. But on another reading, it's the internal evidences taken to the absolute greatest possible extent. Not only were the Old Testament prophets prophesying Jesus, they actually knew the dude. They knew about him by name. So this merger of the Old Testament and the New Testament that happens within the Book of Mormon is a solution to the problem of the internal evidences. And then this is something that I've been working on, and a close friend, Jared Hickman, and uh, you know, Phil Barlow has an essay on this. Uh, that we're all sort of grappling with this question of what the Book of Mormon and Mormonism writ large do with time. Because the questions of internal evidences are really questions of time and temporal separation. Old Testament came before the New Testament. How do you make them unified? How do you bring them together again? How do you reconcile them? And what's phenomenal about the Book of Mormon is the extent to which time is obliterated. You get them looking up to talk to us, to the 19th century Mormons. You get people from different periods of time suddenly appearing and talking to them. In the beginning, in 1 Nephi, you have Jesus and the 12 apostles bringing a Bible to Lehi that's only partially written at that point, and then call him to carry out stuff that will ultimately get written, we presume, into the sacred Bible that they are. I mean, Doctor Who, it, many people love Doctor Who. They got nothing on temporal tangles to the Book of Mormon. 
And that, crucially, messes with the way the Bible is uh, trying to save itself. The Bible is trying to make itself weirdly timeless in the sense that it's timeless but not really. There's not a promiscuous intermixing of time. It's that it's sort of, it gives us access to something separated from time. But in the Book of Mormon and in Joseph Smith's writings afterwards, you get a temporal jumble, a mixing that's very different. And those of you that are keyed to these questions, I've, I'm wondering in the book to what extent those are relevant to the questions about temporal homogeneity that Charles Taylor espies in secular modernity. Here is a great one. This is again Wild Bill. I think he, Parley Pratt's the more serious uh, theologian, Orson Pratt's the more serious crazy theologian, and Wild Bill is just the like awesome raconteur and sci-fi writer and just hilarious. He's, he's like the blogger. He's like the funky blogger that people really like but are embarrassed to like. So he, William Phelps, says that, that just absolutely explicitly to my thesis, as to the evidence of the truth of the Bible, we have no eyewitnesses to prove it, for they have been dead many hundred years. And the fashion of saying you believe it is true because your father said so will not amount to proof, but the testimony of the Spirit of God is that it is true. The Book of Mormon, besides the evidence of the Holy Spirit, so he breaks down external evidences. He says you don't have them to rely on the book, to, to rely on for the Bible, killing the Bible. And he says, yeah, fair enough, Spirit of God, I'm with you. Spirit of God definitely testifies. Fine. Spirit of God also bears testament of the Book of Mormon. Besides the evidence of the Holy Spirit, showing that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, has the living witnesses to bear witness that it is true. And um, let me pop to that just temporally. Remember, many people have commented on this. I'm not original here. I'm just reminding you of something that's well known. The Book of Mormon has in mind in its own text the requirement for affidavits attesting to its truth. The Book of Mormon knows that it's got to solve the external evidences problem. So it says, here they come, be ready for them. And then in the 1830 book, there are attestations in the back, the three and the eight witnesses. And that's what Phelps is talking about. Very self-consciously, the Book of Mormon is showing how amazingly better than the Bible it is as it rereads the Bible. So it kills the Bible to replace it. If I believed in Freud, I'd say something non-sexual about Oedipus. I don't believe in him, so I didn't. Uh, apologies for the preterition. Now, the other question uh, that's addressed around evidential Christianity is this fascinating passage. Jared Hickman does some really fun stuff with it, thinking about racist Nephites forgetting to tell the story of the Lamanites, which I think is marvelous, and you ought to read it. For my purposes here, this is a master class by Jesus in making sure that the external evidences are present in the ultimate text. Samuel Lamanite Lamanite prophesies there will be a miracle. The white dudes forget to write down the fulfillment of the miracle. Jesus comes and he says, you, you didn't document the external evidence. You didn't document the miracles that prove what's supposed to be happening. And to this point, not enough time, I'll just gesture toward it. Remember, there are a couple of circumstances where people are actually murdered on the basis of scriptural interpretation. They say, we're going to kill you if these external evidences don't come true. In Samuel the Lamanite, you can see this as a part of that tension about the need to prove that the book is true. And then the canonization problem, holy Hannah, this is again, this is a prophetic masterclass in canonization. The whole book is named after the canonizer. Everybody's very careful to say, I got this text, I kept track of them, nobody despoiled them. There's those I'm a loser little sections early in the Book of Mormon <laughs> where the guy says, I'm a total loser, the only reason I exist is to make sure you know the text was not corrupted. Here's my imprimatur, not corrupted. There are not alternative texts, we didn't lose track of them, we got it. We're canonized. We're ready to go. And interestingly, it has a potential for a dynamic canonization because there's the discovery of Ether's record, which would have been a lost book if you had the typical Protestant mindset that the one Bible is the only thing. 
But in the Mormon, the Book of Mormon flexible regional scriptural model, books can appear as they need to. And when they do appear, they can be welcomed in the canon, crucially, through a prophet translator. So it solves the question of which texts belong, it solves the question of translation, and it solves the question of interpretation. Altogether, canon solves it. And then, Mormon very explicitly gives the text, the canon, to Moroni, his son, and then Moroni hands it to Joseph Smith. They're basically these ancient prophets and Joseph Smith together, I think, laughing over their near beer at the King James Version of the Bible, right? The King James Version of the Bible is pathetic in its account of its canonization. A, it doesn't even talk really about the selection except, oh, maybe we disagree with the Catholics about whether we ought to have the Apocrypha in. And B, there's some frickin' king. What does a king have to do with any of this stuff? Whereas the Book of Mormon has canon just totally solved. And then this question of how do you build a church out of a Bible? Bible can't do it. Alexander Campbell sure wished it could. It just doesn't have enough information. But the Book of Mormon, notice that it does. It addresses the question of what to call a church. When you're trying to figure out, let's have a church, let's have a thing. One of the first things you do is you try to summarize what you think the thing is about and what it will be on the basis of its name. That's a really important part of getting a church. And if a book can't even tell you the name of a church, how on earth can you get from that book to that church? Well, Book of Mormon can. It says you've got to call it the Church of Jesus Christ. Who do you ordain? What are the offices? Book of Mormon takes the time to lay it out. What do you do for prayers for the Eucharist? The Bible is notoriously indistinct on this question. It gives rise both to the Catholic Mass and to the wide array of commemorative Lord's Supper celebrations that you see in Protestantism. Book of Mormon says, oh, by the way, you know, here's Moroni, he's all alone, he's looking to us, he's seen us in vision, and he says, oh, by the way, you're going to need to build a church in a straightforward way. Here are the Eucharist prayers. So I will close and then be open for you to tell me how I'm wrong uh, and then learn from you. After one thing, as, as I got through this and realized that what was happening with the Book of Mormon was that it was reappropriating the Bible. It was taking it over and changing the grounds of reading it. I've become convinced that Christer Stendhal, he was a Lutheran uh, bishop and an academic uh, in the United States, intermittently a Swedish guy, super bright. He wrote what I think was one of the more perceptive analyses of the Book of Mormon by an outsider and said that the Book of Mormon's a targum of the Bible. Thing to know about targums, other than it sounds like something you'd have to deal with if you were a high school teacher cleaning up the chairs after uh, school was out, is that a targum comes from a situation where Aramaic Jews wanted access to the Hebrew scriptures, which were written in an outmoded biblical Hebrew. So Hebrew is by then a dead language. It's a little bit like asking any of us in Payson to read the Bible in Latin or something like that. It, it's, it's pretty distant. So the Aramaic, a, a cousin language, they needed access to it. And they developed a tradition of oral interpretive translations paraphrastic, explanatory, amplifying. They were held to be translations, but they were translations with benefits. They were also allowed to do other kinds of work. And there's a long-standing argument through Judaism about the status of these oral, flexible, interpretive expansions that came to redirect the written text. So I think that metaphor analogy of the Book of Mormon as a Targum is really quite on. It's a process of coming to own the Bible and transform it. The reason that matters is there's this line of evidence that's become a truism in Mormon history that I think is quite wrong. And that's people have tallied sermons and they've asked, how many times do early Mormons quote a Book of Mormon scripture and how many times do they quote a Bible scripture? There's one simple methodological question that's not addressed, which is that 
the Bible was versified, so it was trivially easy to throw in the versified reference, whereas the Book of Mormon's not versified until the late 19th century. So that's just a methodological problem. But then there's a deeper conceptual problem, and that's the fact that the Book of Mormon was translating the Bible. So when early Mormons cite the Bible, they're citing the resurrected Bible, the transformed, the phoenix risen from the ashes Bible. And that's why there's this argument that early Mormons disregarded the Book of Mormon. And I don't think that's true. I think people have not appreciated the extent to which the Book of Mormon was changing the grounds of reading the Bible. It's a very biblical book. Joe Spencer has done some good work, others have as well. Getting us, Nick Frederick, others have been thinking more and more about the ways in which the Book of Mormon to merge these comparisons is a targum of the Bible. So I think that's an interesting sort of implication of it. The other implication that I'm finding as I'm looking at what's happening in the early 1830s, it really feels to me like the new translation of the Bible is a part of the Book of Mormon project. There's a sense in which a baton is passed. Moroni passes a baton to Joseph Smith. He says, our job is, through Targum or equivalent, prophetically to make the Bible anew, to make it the living word of God. I did my part. Get it into your relevant idioms. Have it address the problems that need to be addressed right now. And now you get about it. And there's a very natural sense, I think, that we've underappreciated in which Book of Mormon, as Joseph Smith's prophetic calling, morphs into the early revelations of the 1830s that are really grappling. You, you know, the, the vision, the olive leaf, uh, what I'm calling the true light, Doctrine and Covenants 93, these are all parts of that same process that's exemplified by the Book of Mormon right along through. So on that note, and yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop talking. So I think I'm old enough now that I can ask the audience for their comments without having somebody to mediate. Unless you're going to say something that hurts my feelings. Then I'm going to have Christian protect me. George. So I generally try to do historical stuff so that no one will force me to take a stand on live controversies that will alienate my co-religionists. Uh, so my main thing that I do for contemporary Mormonism is I bake cookies as an elders quorum president. <laughs> cookies of the priesthood, uh, Yale Crest Second Ward, come have some cookies. Um, I, I try to be, I was just trying to be funny, it sort of amused a few of you. The, the, I, it's hard for me. 
uh, in part because there's a sense that the documentary hypothesis is um, both definitely true and definitely invested with the authority of what we think of as new, you know, modern ideas about detached reason. Uh, the documentary hypothesis is not remotely scientific. It's a literary critical tool. So for those of us that um, are not professional Bible interpreters, uh, always a little bit leery of any wild claims about it. So I think there's a reason to be gently skeptical about definitely any particular claims about uh, contemporary Bible scholarship. Uh, so there's that little bit of a caveat that there's a question of who, who gets to interpret. And I think for a lot of contemporary Mormons to say, oh sure, I endorse the documentary hypothesis, is saying that the people who get to interpret these sacred texts are secular professors uh, with no faith commitments. So there's an element of who gets to be in charge. And you could make an argument, I'm not making it, I'm just describing a possibility, you could make an argument that the core truth around the Book of Mormon is that the Bible is flexible precisely in its need for a live prophet. So then it's a question not so much about the integrity of the Bible, which is clearly dismissed in early Mormonism, but about the question of who is the source of the Targum. Is it the prophets or is it secular academics? So I think that's a component of it. Now, I will confess that I am friendly to much of the documentary hypothesis and really enjoy reading uh, much of the very brightest output from the professional Bible scholars. And I think of it as an important input into my encounter with it. Uh, but do not think that they own the Bible or really ought to own the Bible. So there's that sort of resistance to it. Uh, to the question, the practical question, um, I sort of wonder how much do we actually lose from people not being particularly informed about professional Bible scholarship? Those of us that are intellectuals are a little embarrassed by our co-religionists. Um, how, in what way is their life made inferior by not being particularly interested in the latest scholarship from Bart Ehrman? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I try to be honest. I, and it, this sounds like I'm being a little bit of an obscurantist, anti-academic, and I'm not intending to be so. I'm just trying to be open to the fact that for me, I don't feel like I can understand the Bible without reading professional Bible scholarship. I really don't. And I feel like I personally would be lessened as a student of the Bible by not having it. But I also feel like I need to be very good at running life support systems in the ICU. I don't feel like all of my co-religionists need to be really good at running life support systems in the ICU, and I don't know that I feel like most of my co-religionists need to. So I, I'm not convinced that we would be better off of as, as a church if we push really hard to get people reading professional Bible scholarship as devotion for all of us. Well, let me, let me rephrase the question. I, I'm not really um, uh, convinced myself that that's a need. I agree with you. But, but there is a tendency to form folk theologies around conversations that we have about the Bible that, that whether or not they came directly from biblical scholarship uh, could be improved by a kind of willingness to see the flexibility that we're granted by virtue of our theological position vis-a-vis -vis the Bible that allows us to, to look at things more metaphorically, for example, if we have to, and without the high level of discomfort that maybe we're doing something um, unfaithful if we, if we read a biblical story and say, okay, um, maybe, maybe this doesn't have to be only in flexibility that the Book of Mormon teaches about text and textuality and interpretation and an ongoing process, it seems like there's this weird sort of side pool of resistance to that in relationship to the Bible that, that I, can't, I can't quite understand. At a practical level, I think I could rephrase what you're asking slash proposing as 
a hope that uh, our fellow saints could make worship a little less painful for us intellectuals. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to say it in a bad way. I really do strongly self-identify as an intellectual. And I guarantee you that I would have more fun at church if I didn't hear Protestant fundamentalism uh, <laughs> describing biblical texts. I guarantee you I would have more fun at church. But the request, the request that our fellow saints abandon Protestant fundamentalist Bible readings is really a request to make us feel more comfortable in the body of Christ. And I think it's a valid request. But in general, I try to think in relationships. If I'm asking for an accommodation, what accommodations can I be making? What things could I be doing as a devoted intellectual to make the church a happier or a better place for people who are not intellectual? So I think, I think there has to be a sense of, of sharing and of being open to what happens. So for me personally, I've become much less brash in church. Ten years ago, good heavens, if you were if you were not voting for Nader, you were not uncomfortable in a Sunday school class with me. Uh, and I've realized that I gotta grow up and I can't force people to sit through my ultra left wing lectures just to come to church. And so I've pulled back and I'm now much less brash in church than I was at the same time that periodically in, time, in ways that I think will give people some sense of the proximity of God, I'll bring in something that seems quite obvious from a review of professional Bible scholarship. But I think, for me, I'm not convinced that it's an unalloyed good that we become more modern in our Bible interpretations. I do feel much more nourished as a saint by people who are able to use that language with me, but I understand that it's not one that's universally shared. You had a comment. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say, um, for what I understand, the Bible said there's no higher power, higher authority than the word of the Lord, though. Because we believe in the continued liberation, but that's not all the word of the Lord, though. And uh, for example, do you know, we have um, Doug Benson said that the word of the Lord is the law who covered the universe, but the Godhead that not only presided the church, but presided the whole universe. And the book is not owned by the man. The reason why, because the power and authority is belong to God. So for example, consider the time of uh, Noah when, uh, when the earth was flooded by the earth. There was no power, no authority can be able to stop it. Noah did it was it was only through the power and authority of God. So another example, when Moses delivered the people out from Israel or, and divided the Red Sea, it was only through the power and authority of God. So it was not what proved the power of men was the, the dead power was more than, uh, than the power that aided the human diversity though. And that's why the Bible said that the, the, the book cannot be owned by the men because the power and authority was belong to God though. Yeah, I think commonly when people are grappling with the question of what is language and what is a book and what is scripture, they're really trying to say, what is the capacity of this book or text or encounter to bring me to the presence of God. Not only that, but the power for creation, the power for resurrection, it's all belong to God though, because man cannot do that by itself, he has to go through God though. Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. We're using different terms. But people struggling to understand how the books work are struggling to understand how much access do these give me to the power of God. In the back. Was that the case, like they felt that the Book of Mormon was there to help reinterpret the Bible, or was it you know, just another testament of Jesus Christ to be a companion side by side by the Bible? Which is something I routinely say on my mission. So one thing that I think you can take away from this history is that the relationship of the Bible and the Book of Mormon can be dynamic. That precisely this hybrid model of scripture that Joseph Smith elaborates allows for the possibility that there would be different modes of scriptures interacting over time. 
the early Mormons were vehement anti-Protestants, deeply anti-Protestant, in a way that we're not so much anymore. And, and it may have been that it was important for us to be anti-Protestant early on, to differentiate in an important way, to communicate what was important to us, and that now it makes it's more important to the Lord that we collaborate with people of other denominations. The, the relationship between the Bible and the Book of Mormon early in Mormonism is clearly the Book of Mormon taking over the Bible. Taking over it meaning that the Book of Mormon provides the right way associated with a church, associated with ongoing revelation, associated with a solution to all of the problems that the Bible had. The Book of Mormon wielded that authority. So when Mormons talked about the Bible, you had to watch. Were they talking about the Bible that's been transformed by the Book of Mormon? Or were they talking about the Bible that the Protestants believed in? And if it was the Bible the Protestants believed in, Mormons were quite critical of that. As George was talking, they, they repeatedly called out the flaws and problems with the Protestant Bible. But the Bible transformed by the Book of Mormon, they felt quite comfortable with. And in fact, were extremely uh, in favor of it. So another possible answer to the evolution now is that once the Book of Mormon had killed off the Protestant Bible, it was okay living in, in harmony with this transformed Bible. Yeah? Um, your explanation kind of leads me to this observation and question that um, at what point did Joseph Smith start saying that, or did church leaders start saying that the restoration of the gospel was restoring the gospel and the organization of the church as it was in Christ's time? And then we get these like Ephesians and, and uh, prophets, pastors, and evangelists kind of talk that still persists in like preaching the gospel today that we are kind of originalists when it comes yeah. to this. And, it, and part of it, I think, is your kind of talk about this revised Bible and the idea that, well, the first thing that you need to be really like Jesus to say is a prophet to tell you what scripture is. But it, I, I still see a little bit of tension there, and I see it in in Catholic doctrines as, as well that there's this like tendency towards originalism and we're doing things just like Jesus did them and in addition to that we need these people, these, this prophetic line to continue this revelation at the same time in part to tell us what Jesus was thinking. Yeah, you're absolutely correct that there's always a tension. There's a tension between the notion of a living church, a living scripture, a hybrid scripture that can change, and a deep devotion to what is ancient and always true. Uh, one possible solution to that that would require us to be a little bit more open to uh, different ideas about time. I'm not going all Deepak Chopra on you. I'm a little more Augustine on you. Um, but there's a possibility that the primordialism is actually that yearning that the sister over there talked about, that yearning to be present in the atemporal perfection of God. You know, perhaps it's the God, the true light that I'm talking about here beyond uh, our eternal Father, beyond our Heavenly Father. But if we think of primordialism as fundamentally a yearning, a righteous yearning to be present beyond time with God, then you could have be very open to a devotion to primordialism and a recognition that the incarnation of that a temporal perfection varies over time in our mortal world. If you resist a temporality, as many Mormons have, and are strictly transtemporal, that tension becomes rather acute. Thanks. I think we're out of time. I think it's time for people to eat and drink and be merry, but not alcohol. Thank you so much. No, that, that if you want to take that well, I think we can take the conversation out and then take the conversation out. I didn't understand a word you said. Is there a prophet to interpret? <laughs> I think you said we should disassemble. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs>